What I'm going to give you today is my perspective as a central Indiana farmer. Uh, I'm not going to say it applies anywhere beyond our farm gate, but it uh, has worked for some other people that I've talked to. Um, but basically just talk about what we do and what works, and I think you're going to find, for the most part, the logic that we use and the things that work are very much in agreement with uh, what Eileen has seen it produce. So um, to start that, I'm just going to get my... Uh, my biases and background out of the way. I think that's a good uh, good way to start so that we all understand kind of where we're coming from. Um, so, so, you know, our goal as a long-term no-till farm is to uh, have a farm that's productive and sustainable. Um, we're fourth generation at this point, continuing uh, uh, fifth generation coming on. So we want, to, want this farm to be around for a long time. Uh, we are north central Indiana, just 20 miles north of where you're at right here. So um, certainly if you uh, came in from the north by road, uh, you, you saw so probably some area very close to where we farm, so just, just up US 31. Um, but we've been no-tilling since 1989. Uh, we're mostly a corn bean rotation. We generally have some corn after corn, whether it's uh, uh, evening out fields. Uh, uh, we, do, we do some plots where we have continuous corn after corn versus uh, just changing some fields around, things like that. So we always have some. Uh, we're about 15 years into cover crops. I can't remember exactly the the first year that we tried cover crops, but uh, um, we're, we're 15 years in on this run. Uh, we're maybe uh, closer to 50 or 60 or 70 years in on grandpa's run, if you go back to the first time uh, you know that there were cover crops on, on this land. So uh, certainly it's something that's been around for a long time. Uh, um, we do have a hog farm, uh, so we have 320 acres of liquid hog manure. I just want, we'll address that as we go through. Um, uh, we do a one acre grid fertility management, VRT, everything we do is fairly intensive. Cover crops, the, the point here is, and what I'm going to go through in this first couple of slides here is just uh, cover crops are part of a system for us, and I think that's the, the really important thing I want to impress today is how to make cover crops fit into your system. So uh, I think that's very important. Um, we do believe that conservation is the best economic model. We're accountable for what leaves our farm. We are directly north of the uh, Morris Reservoir, if you're familiar with the area, but anyway, part of the, the Indianapolis drinking water supply, uh, which they are actually currently uh, spending 20 years and $3 million to dredge that reservoir to get the soil out that has uh, inadvertently gotten there, mostly due to tillage. So. Uh, we, we have a responsibility, we believe, to be able to go out into the community and say, you know, we're doing our job to keep the water clean, keep the nutrients out, and, and we believe that going forward there's going to be accountability for that as well. So um, we think that's very important. So that's, that's the introduction and our biases and where we're from. Uh, you may have heard uh, Ken talk in the last session. He's my cousin that I farm with. I think he even snuck in in the back. So, uh, um, uh, but hopefully he tells the same story I do, but uh, <laughs> so uh, um, anyway, um, j just a note here, and I, and I put this on here, um, this is what, one of Ken's slides that he likes, uh, um, sustainability requires carbon capture technology. So what that means is turning sunlight into energy. We've got solar panels on the farm that turn sunlight into electricity, which we can sell to the power company. Uh, and it's the same idea in the soil. We want to turn sunlight into energy in the soil and store carbon in the soil. Uh, so we're, we're using the cover crop to capture that seven month brown gap and, and take sunlight energy that would otherwise be wasted and put it into um, energy in the soil for building the soil. Um, so a healthy soil is a system. Like I said, that's what we're going to review here real quickly. Um, Certainly, I think the first thing and most important thing for us is that it's a no-till system, which uh, involves uh, you know, all the aspects of no-till, water infiltration, improving organic matter, um, all those sorts of things. Cover crops are part of that system. Um, you know, soil, building soil carbon, uh, drainage, all these things. We're going to go through a couple of slides here that just talk about what, what I think are the most important parts of the system. And for us, if any part of this, you know, Dan, Dan talked this morning in the general session about the legs of the stool and, and needing all of those to be there. Well, these are all parts of the system that to make the cover crop part of the system work, I think, are, uh, are all critical. 
So, so for us, if we can achieve this goal of healthy soil, uh, number one, like Eileen said, again, I'm going to agree with Purdue. The, yeah. the, the <laughs> bottom line is we want increased yield. We want, we want more bushels, uh, you know, better economics on the farm. So um, increased yield is, is the top goal there. Uh, but along the way, that healthy soil is also going to give us better soil biology, uh, nutrient cycling and efficiency, uh, drought tolerance, which is going to lead to better economics, healthier crops, um, you know, increased water infiltration, better plant health, improved structure and economics. So th those are all positives that you've heard about all day today uh, from the uh, um, use of cover crops and all different uh, soil health practices. Um, so the, so the first part of this, the first leg on this, this stool for our farm is continuous no-till, not rotational. We've, we've got to eliminate all catastrophic tillage events. And then we do consider a tillage event catastrophic on our farm. I can, I think, safely say that here. Most places I say that, I duck after I say it. But um, we, 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 do, uh, we do believe that every time we have to do tillage for some reason, it sets our system back. It's a negative, it does not produce more yield, it does not improve anything about the system. When we do it, it's because we have something we need to correct and we try to do it as seldom as possible. Usually it's after we've done some drainage work or something like that and we just need to, uh, to level the soil so we can farm it efficiently. Um, so certainly you want that no-till to improve the soil structure. Um, drainage, for us, uh, I don't think here in central Indiana, I know other places in the world where you don't get as much rainfall and things, you can talk about using cover crops and not talk about drainage. For us here, I can't really talk about co using cover crops without talking about having proper drainage, whether it's surface drainage, subsurface drainage, uh, proper air and water mix and structure in the soil, at least at a base level, because if I do not have those things right, I can't get proper establishment of the cover crop, I don't get good rooting, uh, you know, well, so, so if, if we don't correct some of these basic things, parts of the system, uh, we don't get what we need to get out of the cover crop and out of the no-till. So certainly we have our own drainage business, uh, have for many years, and do a lot of drainage work on our farm as well as on neighbors, which uh, side benefit of that is we get to go on a lot of neighbors' farms and, and dig soil pits. Uh, they call them tile connections, we call them soil pits, and uh, see a lot of what's going on under all sorts of different management, and it's quite interesting. Uh, we've been doing that the last week on some, some custom work, and uh, um, all I will say there is the, the difference between conventional tillage and no-till is significant. And the no-till soil structure, the color and tilth and health of the soil is significantly better. So uh, nice to get a chance to see that. Again, I mentioned already that we do one acre grid fertility, uh, variable rate. We like to uh, make sure we've got, if you're going to use cover crops and no-till to build soil structure, you need to have adequate calcium and other nutrients there to accomplish that. So um, you need to minimize soil disturbance. I went out uh, the two pictures. So we, we've got our, our nitrogen applicator as well as our manure applicator pictured there. Uh, the two pictures of the growing cover crop I went out and took yesterday. Uh, those are actually, uh, and it's very hard to tell. In the top picture, you can see the curves a little bit where they turned, but those, those have actually had hog manure incorporated into that cover crop just about a week ago. So growing cover crop, hog manure incorporated five inches under the soil surface, and that's what it looks like just less than a week later. So you're able to do that. Go ahead and get the cover crop established. We use uh, that bar there with the Dietrich sweeps and a drag line, uh, are actually able to incorporate liquid hog manure into a growing cover crop. Cover crop roots immediately interact with the nitrogen and nutrients in the manure, store that for the next crop. Tremendously valuable system for us uh, where we have animal ma manures to use. Um, so, so once we've got you know, low disturbance technology and minimized compaction and got the drainage right and got the no-till working right, now we're ready to talk about cover crops. So that's really what you came here to hear. So, uh, um, sorry. So really for, for us, that was 15 years ago. We had been working really hard at this no-till system and figuring out all these different uh, pieces of the puzzle and how to make everything work. And we reached this point where we started 
realizing that there was more to it than just the physical and just the chemical. Uh, we needed to do things, earthworms from, I, Eileen's old uh, talks about earthworms years ago uh, really hit home and, and go, going uh, probably 18 years ago, going to a no-till conference, talking to a gentleman about uh, earthworms and, and how to stimulate those. And he said, you know, I always plant an oak cover crop and the earthworms just love it. <laughs> and this guy was at the time, you know, 70, 80 years old, and he'd been doing this his whole life. And he said, you just can't believe what it does. And the earthworms love it. And I said, well, we like worms. They're doing our tillage for us. We don't want to do tillage. We'll let them do it. So let's try feeding the worms, see if we can get more worms. And, uh, and by golly, that was the beginning uh, of this 15-year journey that we've been on that we're kind of talking about now and the things that we've learned. Uh, but certainly feeding that biology uh, with the cover crops, building the organic matter is what we're looking to do as the next step in this system. So once, once we've got a no-till system established, then we look at it as, as our next step. So uh, for us, once we uh, first started to see the benefits, I kind of identified uh, some things that we wanted, to, I, I noticed right away, we were trying different cover crops because at that point 15 years ago, we really didn't know what was gonna work and what it would do in the soil and things like that. So I kind of identified different farms and different things that we would like to address uh, that maybe we were addressing with steel or chemically or, or other ways. Uh, very much like Eileen said, you know, we've got a, this, this laundry list of things that we want to do with cover crops that's going to kind of dictate the cover crops that we're going to use. So obviously we want to remove compaction without tillage, so, so the radish made a lot of sense for that. Um, we want to transition uh, from tillage into no-till, so maybe we need a rye that has a little more biomass and those kind of things to help uh, uh, start building that organic matter. Uh, we want to get a rotational advantage, so we need to uh, throw something different in there, maybe the brassica or a legume uh, somewhere different in the mix to get a rotational advantage. Um, you know, to, we want to boost that biology and that uh, soil, soil quality. We want to trap the nitrogen like I talked about from the manure or just the carryover left over from the corn crop. Um, erosion control, I'm going to show a couple pictures that uh, we, we're on flat land here, basically, is what we're told, and we're, we don't have erosion, but I've got a couple pictures coming up that'll, that'll maybe dispel that myth. Um, we want to break the, where we have corn after corn, we always want to have a cover crop there to help break that disease cycle, you know, kind of trick, trick those bugs into uh, thinking there's something else going on there. Um, we want, Certainly nutrients are expensive and we're trying to cycle those and hold on to them. Um, we want to build organic matter. And uh, you know, the last one there, like I said in the opening, uh, Grandpa used cover crops. He was a pretty smart guy. We're still living off a lot of the benefits and things that he did. And, and so maybe it was something at this point that we needed to look at and try and figure out why it was that he was spending the time and the money to do that. So, um, so those were kind of our reasons for, for looking at cover crops. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the, the example, we don't have erosion. Uh, this is in Eileen's plot on our farm, and <laughs> so I'm going to blame it on her. Uh, I actually get the question every year from the guys at this point, do we have to keep leaving the no cover crop strip, right? So it's just getting to the point where everybody's tired of looking at it. But uh, what you can see up here is uh, left of the screen, we've got our no cover crop strip in a, in a half mile long field. You can see it's basically flat, but there's water movement across that field. This is in January, you know, ground's uh, a little stiff and, and we get a rainfall and the water's moving across the top and you can see the water moving and carrying soil uh, in that bean stubble on the left. That's a cereal rye cover crop in January, not terribly big, it's already, you know, been frozen back. Um, but it's there and established. Uh, bottom right, you can see where that's where that uh, the topography forced that water to come over and cross onto that short cereal rye cover crop. And what you'll actually see there is within 60 feet, we've gone from dirty, milky water carrying soil and nutrients, all deposited into that cereal rye cover crop, and clean water coming off the other side of that strip. So um, certainly, even in flatland, shows the the benefit to having. Uh, the cover crop to keep the nutrients, even if it's just in place within the field. This may not have left the field, but it wasn't where we put it anymore, which to me is erosion. If it doesn't, if we put, if we go to this trouble to have one acre grids and put our fertilizer where we want it, and then it washes to a different part of the field, 
then it's no longer where I wanted it and I've got the risk to lose it, so I want to avoid that. So certainly that's a great example. Um, this was a good example I got this spring. Uh, one of our neighbors that says he doesn't have erosion. Um, I think he does. Uh, he was actually out uh, this fall after harvest, I hear, with a, uh, with a dozer and a uh, pan at the bottom end of this uh, uh, waterway collecting the dirt and bringing it back up to the top. So he's recycling. So, um, but uh, um, anyway, so that, that is certainly uh, something that happens. You can see the, the bottom left picture there is uh, a similar situation, water coming across uh, one of our fields on a cover crop that's established in the spring. And just, yeah, the water's leaving the field. It's clean, clear, nothing in it. Um, certainly what we're looking to see. Um, Eileen mentioned wind erosion. So we don't have wind erosion in our area, but we do, <laughs> especially around springtime and tillage. So this, this is one of those bad cases where we had to do some tillage to level a couple of tile runs that we had put in. So the two pictures you're looking at there are the same day, same field, same wind conditions, everything the same. The only difference is we've got a cereal rye cover crop that's been killed on the bottom, absolutely no dust, no soil leaving the farm. Uh, just a huge plume of dust where we've just done a single pass with a field cultivator to um, try and smooth out those tile runs that we put in. And, and that's the difference in a single pass of how much, how much nutrients and, and soil that we're, are blowing away in that one pass and across the road onto the neighbor or further. Um, so uh, that being said, that's why we use cover crops on our farm. I certainly think uh, if you're going to look into cover crops on your farm or advise somebody that's looking at cover crops on their farm, uh, you need to identify what that goal is. And, and it may not be the same on every field, may not be the same every year, may not be the same after every crop. But, you know, are you going to try and remove compaction? Do you want something that's easy to manage to start out with, like Eileen was talking about? Uh, do you want to control and, and break that disease cycle? Uh, are you looking to, to scavenge? You look into control erosion or work on those rotations or any of the other reasons. But certainly I think it's important to identify because that's going to really dictate what you choose as a cover crop on your farm. Um, you know, you can see the difference there between a brassica uh, and certainly the, the penetration that it's doing and, and more of a grass that's uh, um, got the fibrous root. So two totally different root types, two different outcomes. And, uh, you know, maybe you want them both together, maybe you specifically want one. Um, so on our farm, uh, we were led to, uh, these are the things that we're currently using on our farm to one degree or another. Uh, certainly cereal rye, uh, annual rye grass, oats, radish, clover, rape, barley, Austrian peas, vex, and mixes of all of the above. Uh, in one form or another. So those, those are the things I'm familiar with that we've been able to work with and make work here in central Indiana in a corn soybean rotation. Um, this, I, I always get the question, so we'll just throw it out there. And if you want to take a picture of it, then uh, you're more than welcome to. So um, this, this is our uh, fall 2017 mixes going to uh, crops in the spring of 18. So the top two mixes in the center there are going to be our, our uh, going to corn in 18. So this would be soybean stubble, going to be no-tilled into corn. Uh, the first mix is our first, and, and I'll mention, I was going to mention later, but we, we're very um, specific about variety selection, hybrid selection, uh, as part of our cover crop program in our cash crop. So we, we try and, as much as we can push uh, maturities earlier, we do, so that we can get out there and get that cover crop established and growing. Uh, for us, we grow a lot of 2.5, a lot of 2.7 soybeans, so we can get those off in September and get an establishment of the cover crops. What we found in this system is that is not a, an issue on yield. They always yield just as well, if not better, than our, than our group 3 beans uh, in this system where we're, where we're mitigating soil temperature and holding on to moisture. The shorter season beans do just fine. Uh, similar situation with corn. But that, so that being said, we, we try and get out there and get these planted as quick as we can. Um, but our, so our, our primary first mix that we're gonna plant on soybean stubble that's gonna go to corn next year is gonna be oats, radish, rape, and crinsmith clover. Uh, 
Uh, that is a great mix. You can see the top right photo there. That is what remains in the spring, which is rape and crimson clover. Um, not bad to plant into. A beautiful, you can see the bottom right picture there, a beautiful, tilthy seed bed uh, with all of those fibrous roots growing through the winter. Uh, with the radish and the oats having died out in the winter time, you're left with a fairly sparse, there's still a lot of roots that are holding the soil and taking care of the erosion, but it's a uh, fairly easy, there's not a lot of top growth to plant through, doesn't create a lot of problems, easy to kill. Uh, so super happy with that mix. You've got uh, uh, in the earlier planted stuff, the clover generally will go ahead and um, nodulate and make some nitrogen. We don't usually count on it because where we're at and as late as we're planting the clover, it's not going to be consistent across the field. And honestly, when Eileen talked about needing nitrogen in the bank, our goal with the cover crops is to build soil organic matter, build soil health. We want to deposit that nitrogen that we're either able to scavenge or create with the cover crops into the soil to build organic matter. It takes a lot of nitrogen to build organic matter. If we rob it back out of the soil by shorting ourselves on our nitrogen recommendations, we're going to limit ourselves on how much um, organic matter we can build in the soil. So our goal there is not to um, is not to steal that nitrogen back out, it's to leave that to build the organic matter. Uh, soybeans, our group three, late group three soybeans that come off, uh, obviously we're getting too late for some of those things in that first mix. Uh, so we're going to go to a half rate of cereal rye, uh, still fairly thin come springtime, easy to plant into at 15 pounds, uh, 15 pounds of oat that's going to winter kill, and three pounds of rape that at that time of year is probably going to survive the winter, but not always. So, um, so we're going to have 15 pounds of cereal rye come spring for sure, and maybe some rape out there. Uh, still a pretty easy mix to plant into, does a nice job of holding the soil. Uh, so going to soybeans, so in corn stalks, um, we actually, and I'll show some pictures later if we get uh, time, um, we're trying to, we used to do cereal rye on everything, we're trying to split that up a little bit now. We're having some issues with voles and things like that. And, and the early planted cereal rye gets so big and so aggressive uh, that we're trying on our early harvested corn, uh, this mix with oats, radish, and rape, uh, similar to what we're doing um, without the clover, similar to what we're doing ahead of the corn. And we've had real good preliminary results on that. Um, when we tried it last year, and then as it gets later and we can't plant anything else, then we're going to a, a fairly thin 35 pounds of cereal rye drilled. So, um, cost on those, you can snap another picture of that. I don't think we have time today, or won't have time today to talk too much about cost. Uh, but suffice it to say, um, we're going to be talking $14.50 an acre average for our mixes across the board. Um, some are a little more, some are a little less, but that's about our cost per acre for seed. It's going to cost another $12 an acre for labor, fuel, tractor hours, um, repairs, all of those things. So you're going to be at $26, $27 uh, per acre for your cover crop uh, drilled. Um, and that, that's about where we're at on it. So, and if you're wondering, we did plant 5,200 acres and that was all drilled after harvest with a 40-foot drill. So if anybody wants to drive a drill part-time, you're welcome <laughs> to come on over because uh, that's a, it was uh, uh, something like 300 hours or tractor hours on the drill this year. So um, certainly that's a challenge and a reason that as we look at planting methods, I, I don't recommend necessarily that everybody do it all with a drill. Uh, planting dates. Uh, that kind of go along with those things that I said we use. Uh, obviously, if you've got wheat, your crop's coming off in the summer. So, you know, first week of August, you can plant all sorts of things. You've got opportunities to plant, um, you know, summer um, mixes that, that we just don't use. Uh, you know, sorghum, sudan, all, all sorts of really neat mixes that'll do a lot of things and build a lot of organic matter. That's not, we don't have wheat, so that's not something we normally do. Um, so these are kind of end dates for me. I will push them a little bit, but in general, uh, September 15th, if I haven't got Austrian peas planted by September 15th, 
then they're probably not going to make it through the winter. They're fairly expensive and it's kind of hard to justify. So uh, if we've got a year where we, got, where we know we got early beans planted early, it's been a hot summer, we're probably going to get a week or so prior to that where we can get some planted. Uh, then we'll go ahead and get some Austrian peas. If not, uh, this year we didn't start really harvesting until the 20th of September. No Austrian peas this year. So um, October 1st is where I would like to have the cutoff for oats, radish, and clover. Um, they seem to do, if you can get them ahead of October 1st, they'll almost always be successful. I'll usually push it that first week of October depending on the weather. Sometimes they get enough growth to feel like it's worth it, sometimes they don't. Um, but October 1st is usually a pretty safe date. Uh, October 21st, so three weeks into October, uh, in our area I find uh, annual ryegrass. That's about the end of when I would like to plant it to keep it from winter killing out, and the rapeseed as well. Those both are, are pretty good up till then. Um, cereal rye, uh, I said November 10th, I needed a date. Uh, I've often told guys you can plant it on Christmas if you want to get out of the house, I think. Uh, it seems like it goes no matter what. We actually just finished planting cereal rye uh, on the last day of November. So that was the last that we planted this year. Uh, I may germinate this winter, may not germinate till spring. It'll grow fast enough in the spring that we'll get our benefit out of it. So um, obviously not ideal, but uh, we had it in the shed and it's better to, to have it out there than in the shed. So, um, so, but again, I got a note there, corn and soybean maturities matter when you're trying to hit these kind of time frames. Uh, so I think it's important to select maturities, even if you're going to use aerial application uh, or some sort of spreader or surface application in crop. Uh, it's important when those crops are going to come off and mature so you start getting daylight to the ground uh, to help them grow. So certainly shorter maturities are better. Um, planting methods. Uh, we've got a few slides here. Um, certainly, I call all forms of aerial and surface application, so I don't care if it's an airplane, a spreader, a high boy with a cedar on it, a corn head with a cedar on it, what it whatever it is, if you're spreading seed on top of the ground, that's, a, that's an aerial or surface application. Um, we have uh, vertical till machines, which are somewhere in between. Some of the seeds on top of the ground, some of the seed falls down in the dirt, some of it gets covered up. Those are, uh, um, depending on moisture conditions, can fall one way or the other, more towards aerial application or more towards drill, just depending on what the, what the weather's like. Uh, No-till drill, obviously, is, is my favorite. Uh, the precision planter we, we used for years, and, I, and uh, um, certainly I'll talk about that, and we had great luck with that. Um, but let's just go through real quick. So you can see different results from different planting methods. You know, the nice singulation from the precision planter, uh, the nice total coverage that you get with the aerial application, um, you know, uh, rows with good growth where you, where you drill. So a lot of different things going on there. Precision planter, like I said, was really where we got started on a large scale. We, we were able to take our soybean planter with split rows, uh, set it up with some small hoppers so that we could run one row off of the central fill with uh, like rye or oats or something like that. And then the row in between, we would run clover, radish, those kinds of things. Uh, the one downside, well, two downsides for us on the precision planter, one was cost. That's a very expensive planter to be dragging over the acres in the fall. So if we were only doing a couple hundred acres of cover crops or a thousand acres of cover crops, that was okay. But as we started trying to do more and more, it was a lot of wear and tear on the equipment. Uh, so that began to be a concern uh, that we were spending too much, using too, too expensive a piece of equipment for that job. Uh, so that was really the end reason we got away from it. Also the row spacing, 15 inches is not bad, uh, but ideally I'd like to have my plants a little bit closer together. Uh, the nice thing is with that row spacing, with the precision placement, you can get by with the lowest rates and the lowest cost of any of the seeding methods that we're going to look at. So, so dollar for dollar certainly gets a cover crop on for the least number of dollars uh, that you're going to be able to do it. Um, and you certainly want to be careful not to overseed when you're using 15 inch rows in a precision planter because if you get too if your in-row spacing is too tight, you'll just get top growth, very little root growth, and that's not what you want. Um, 
but certainly a good way to go. Uh, one thing that is difficult is if you're trying to do mixes, especially you know pre-bought you know, packaged mixes that have small and large seed in them, where you're working with plates like this on a precision planter, it's hard to get a plate that will necessarily work with different seed sizes. So that would be why we split the, split the rows and could use one plate type on small seeds and one plate type on the larger ones. Um, I put the no-trail drill and the vertical till together. Those are both methods to put the seed into the soil. I think really the key there is seed to soil contact. Obviously, I'm gonna lean towards the no-till drill is gonna be more consistent and better at doing that, but they are both trying to put the seed into the soil. Um, but certainly, um, you can plant the latest with this. Uh, may, maybe similar to precision planting, I guess, but anything that's gonna lock that seed into the soil, get it growing just as quickly as possible, that lets you push your planting dates the latest, uh, which is a benefit. Uh, again, fairly low cost on seed, not quite as low as the precision planter because your row spacing is generally tighter, uh, but certainly uh, less seed required than your aerial or surface applications. Um, and you can do a lot of things there. So uh, I'm a big fan of the drill. I tell people, you know, if, if you're just gonna start out and try it and you want to be successful, the drill is the way to go because you know what you're going to get. You put it in the soil, it's going to grow and you don't have to worry about whether it rains, doesn't rain, those kind of things. So um, aerial and surface applications, uh, certainly if timing is, is appropriate, I think they work really well. Um, the thing you have to watch out for is that you need more time so your aerial window is going to be pushed forward. So you need to start your air, where I was saying September 15th, that's maybe two or three weeks earlier. So late August is where that same time frame is gonna be with your aerial application because your seed is on top. Uh, you've gotta get enough moisture to get it to germinate and get a root down into the soil. Uh, you're just gonna be a slower establishment with the, with the surface applications. Uh, probably gonna need to have a little bit higher seeding rate. Uh, Partially just because your plant to plant spacing when you're full coverage, uh, it's, you're gonna get a better coverage if you have a few more seeds out there, but also you're gonna have some losses, uh, insects and all sorts of things when that stuff is laying on top. So um, certainly if we're gonna cover the entire Midwest with cover crops, I think we're gonna have to use surface application because we're gonna have to do stuff in crop uh, to get that done. So I'm certainly not against it. Uh, it's, it's my second choice if I have a choice, uh, but when you need to get things done, it certainly, especially if you're short on labor, need to get things planted dirt, you know, ahead of harvest or you, know, you don't have the extra labor during harvest to get it done or you don't have a drill, uh, certainly an effective way to get it done. Um, this is just uh, an example here of uh, aerial versus, uh, what am I doing? A little bit over, we're getting there. Um, so aerial versus, um, th these are all aerial applications. You'll see you get a little bit more spindly um, when you throw it on top of the ground as opposed to uh, the same mix planted with a drill is gonna tend to, I think the tap roots tend to grow a little bit more vigorously when they're put into the soil, which, which you would expect. Grasses, um, cereal rye, oats, annual rye thrown on top of the ground, which you generally would plant fairly shallow anyway, tend to do really well. The fibrous roots, uh, the tap root, more expensive seed I like to put into the ground. Um, so certainly if you're gonna have mixes, uh, you wanna think about how you put that mix together. Uh, you wanna have uh, varying root types so you can get the benefit of fibrous roots as well as tap roots. Uh, you wanna have growth rates that um, you don't want to have a lot of something in the mix that's going to shade everything else out. So be careful with your mixes if you're custom coming up with this magic mix that you like. Um, if you've got a whole bunch of kale in there that's going to have a great big leaf and, and shadow everything else out, and that's, then that's going to be a problem. Um, of course, you've got to think about how you're going to plant it, when you're going to plant it. Um, you know, what, what your goal is if you're trying to scavenge or, or make nitrogen, build organic matter. Um, 
you know, certainly by having mixes, you can improve winter survival. I've seen that with a lot of the things that we plant. Something like oats as a cover in the fall um, can kind of foster through some of those frosts and things that may take out some of the more sensitive seedlings and give them a chance to get established. Uh, so I, I really like that. Um, the last thing to think about on a, on a mix is to think about how you're going to terminate it before you put things in the mix. If you're going to um, have annual ryegrass that you're concerned and you don't want to let it get away from you, so you're going to try and kill it, but you've got a legume that you were really wanting to let grow until June to produce nitrogen, you're either going to have to be really selective with your chemicals or you're going to have, you're going to end up wiping out the money you spent on the legume when you try and go out there with Roundup and, and kill your annual ryegrass. So, so think about what's in the mix and how you're going to terminate and make sure that, you know, your goals for, for all the products in the mix kind of line up with how you're going to terminate them. Uh, certainly you want a quality seed source. Um, you got to think about how you're going to blend it and deliver it. Um, termination, um, aerial misapplication, obviously um, it's not, most of the pilots now have got enough experience, they're getting pretty good, but we can have issues with gates and things like that. You need to know if you've got people around you that grow wheat and you're going to fly on cereal rye, those two do not go well together and if your neighbors get their field rejected, they're not going to be happy about it if you dribble, dribble cereal rye into their wheat field. Um, so those kind of things certainly. Um, Real quick there, you know, this is a great example here. Um, we saw this again just yesterday when I was out digging. Um, this, this particular picture is a couple of years old, but in the fall right now at this time, we've got 40 plus inches worth of root growth out of that mix that I drilled in, in September and October. Um, even fairly small top growth on the oats and the rape and we're getting roots down easily to 40 inches. And they're growing, I mean, it's, you can see them there growing around the tile. They're not causing any problem in that, in that old clay tile that we broke into there. Um, you can see the tile line that may be hooked to something coming from that house. Um, you know, I see it scavenging the nitrogen there, which is a good thing, right? That's what they're supposed to be doing. So we're, we're capturing that, keeping it out of the, out of the um, water. And so, that, so that's all good. Obviously there are situations that I've, I've heard about and we've had maybe one or two situations on our farm over the years where we had something, generally on our farm at least, we've had something wrong with a tile system, either a tile that was flat or had a, a belly in it and as those roots start to decay and break off, they can collect in that. You know, if there's uh, something, a connection there that maybe causes them to start collecting. Uh, that's been our experience. I, I've heard all different uh, stories. If you have tile that you think you have issues with or you have a soil type where you believe you could have issues, um, I recommend watching your planting date so that your cover crop doesn't get too, rate, too big, your seeding rate so that it's not too thick, and possibly staying away from some things like cereal rye where you're concerned about that type of root growth. Um, those are all things that uh, I know Purdue has publications out about and there's, it's things that we're learning. We have not seen with thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of cover crop on pattern tiled fields. Um, we've not had much problem, but obviously in certain situations, I, I know that it can be. Uh, Similar thing there with the voles. <laughs> this is our plot again with Eileen. All the bad stuff I, I say is related to the plot with Eileen. And <laughs> but uh, you know you can see here where, where we have some vole pressure on that aerial photo. Uh, we've got annual ryegrass, cereal rye, and oats and radish. The interesting thing is the oats and radish has less vole pressure than even the no cover, uh, which is one of the reasons when I talked earlier about the fact that we were going to start rotating an oat and radish mix through some of our acres of corn stalks uh, to try and help work on this vole population problem. Try and starve them out a little bit basically every couple of years uh, instead of giving them cereal rye to live on every other year. Uh, this particular case we keep the same cover in the same place for 12 or 13 years now. Um, so it's a worst case scenario but, it, but it's a uh, interesting to see how the different cover crops are leading to different growth rates in those in those populations. Those voles are just looking for something to eat over the winter time. Um, uh, obviously, this is what we're looking for: healthy soil, good root growth, good organic matter. You know, 
no layers going down. We got night crawlers hanging out the, the sidewalls there and, and roots down 60 inches deep at that point. And that's, uh, that's a Christmas time photo there. Um, and I just think that that's what we should be looking to get. Um, you know, that nice, you can see there where that's, that's tile plow has run through there. And instead of big, blocky, chunky, nasty pieces of soil, we're getting nice, uh, tilthy soil that just has structure and, and crumbles, uh, certainly what we're looking for. So um, that's kind of our goal. So with, with all of this, that's our goal that we have in mind. And 